Honestly, the guiding phrase, we need to do something for men. Our hearts and our minds were open enough so that we allowed this thing to flow through us, which in retrospect, guys started recognizing rather quickly as an initiation. For those that aren't familiar with the Mankind Project and the experience, the New Era Training Adventure, can you share a little bit about the elements and kind of the philosophy and some of the experience that's that men go through as they have this um, initiation weekend? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a hero's journey where they, they go into a, a descent. We, we kind of take them down. It gets a little dark. It's scary. Some men leave. They can't even, they can't even holler. But the men that hang in there will... Um, get opportunity after opportunity to open their hearts, learn what we call emotional literacy, just experientially. We don't, we don't mm-hmm. teach it academically. It's, the whole thing is pretty much just experiential. And there's an opportunity to go very, very deep into uh, an emotional cathartic process we simply call guts. That's an opportunity for each man to do his own deep shadow work, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the potency of that is it's done in a, in a group. So the men get to see the other men's pain, their anger, their sadness. And there's an enormous bonding healing that happens with that. So that by the time we get to the third day, which is the final Sunday, we've been calling that joy day almost since the beginning, because Mm. uh, joy is the experience of becoming a more complex being. And this training is so intense that men are becoming more complex at so many different levels, you know, cognitively, emotionally, um, relationship wise, that that, um, by the time they're saying goodbye, they're they're just in this pure tears of joy. So it's a very potent thing. that you know, that's why it's spread around the world effortlessly. We don't market at all other than just one man at a time. Yeah. I mean, one of the things for me, you know, I, I had the great uh, privilege and uh, just pure luck in some ways that my father invited me to this experience when I was 22 years old. Actually, he says he invited me you know, for several years earlier, I don't ever remember those invitations. I remember the one at 22 years old. And for me, it was a very clear demarcation. I went in a boy and I came out a man in the most classic sense, you know, this was a, an initiation into manhood and, and the underpinnings for me are, are, you know, these elements that you describe around emotional integrity. And there's just a, a beautiful community of powerful men that are committed to living lives of service and, mm. and mission to something greater than themselves. And there's a, a real focus on how we're contributing, you know, back to the people around us, the people we love. And fundamentally though, for me, it was very much my first experience, a meaningful experience of a rites of passage, right. Of, of, um, kind of a ceremonial marking of, of becoming a man. And, you know, our culture has kind of pushed that aside. And when I look at the work of the mankind project, it's very clearly, you know, re introducing some of these these ceremonial kind of ritual experiences for men. I'm just curious, was that kind of the intention all along or, or how, do you, how do you relate to that idea of this being a rite of passage? You know, honestly, uh, the guiding phrase that the three of us went into it was, we need to do something for men. Mm-hmm. That's how sophisticated it was. <laughs> but our hearts and our minds were open enough so that we allowed this thing to flow through us, which in retrospect, guys started recognizing rather quickly as an initiation. It had all of the the descent and the ordeal and the return. It had all those elements of initiation right in there, even Mm -hmm. though we didn't, we didn't cognitively academically know about rites of passage (laughs) Mm -hmm. or, or any, any of that. It was, it was so pure in a way. It was like, it was channeled. It just Mm -hmm. just was, it was 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 archetypally or something. Let me mention one one more thing that you alluded to there, which is, Mm -hmm. which I failed to mention, which is so significant is that we actually built a transpersonal mission into it right from the beginning. There was something Ron and I had done so much of this rather sophisticated spiritual, psychological inner work that we knew that, that we built it in right from the beginning. And transpersonal means that you have a mission that is way bigger than you are. It's not to serve me or even my family. It's, it's, it's to serve the world in a way. So each man walks out of there with a transpersonal mission and Very few of them actually get it at that point. They really have to go and they have to get into their integration group and they have to do their inner work for several years often before they attain the the sort of um, psycho-spiritual sophistication to even get the concept of a transpersonal mission. And I'm saying that very specifically because I know Mm -hmm. that's what you work with, Luke. And and Mm -hmm. that's that's beautiful. You're helping, helping men take that impulse and really make it manifest. Yeah, that's wonderful. Do you do you uh, carry a mission statement for yourself at this point in your life? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I always have something. Uh, currently, it has to do with helping people um, learn to live from their gift. Beautiful. Gift. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. We all have something to give. And damn near, it's so rare. I, you know, we talked about that earlier. I'm, I'm somebody that lived my gift all my adult life. I'm so fortunate that uh, I had a, an entrepreneurial dad who, uh, you know, he didn't cognitively, again, it was experiential learning. He was such a, he's a, he's a farm kid who became a very successful business guy. And he just, he followed his own, his own. So I, I, I watched and I learned, uh, I learned that entrepreneurial thing and just, just followed it and uh, damned if it didn't work. <laughs> so hmm. Hmm. I've, been, I've been very fortunate. Yeah, wonderful. I want you to go back for a moment to 1984, the mid 80s, and uh-huh. and like the can you for those of us that were maybe not here yet, or for me, I was <laughs> I was too early to know, too young to know what really was happening, right? Yeah. But like, tell us, kind of paint a picture of the culture, of the state of of men, of you know, there were some figures that were coming online. I think about Robert Bly's book. Um, yeah was was just coming on the scene and, and some of the work of uh, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette and mm-hmm. kind of the the Jungian view of the masculine psyche. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what were some of the the inspiration, the the figures, what were the the textures of that moment when this this mm-hmm. thing came into being? That was uh, the era of the of the corporate the corporate man. And there was something about my generation. We were already angry it's like we were looking into the future and we could see what our parents had been through. And there was an awful lot of us that just didn't want it, but we didn't, we also didn't know how to recreate anything else. So we were just, we were a, yeah, just a pretty angry generation and we didn't know what to do with it. Then the Vietnam war came roaring in and that allowed a focus for this kind of diffuse anger. Hmm. And I think that's part of what the women's movement was also, was it was this, this, this kind of felt sense of powerlessness that needed a voice. It needed, a, it needed an expression. So I think that the, uh, the men's work that we created was pure empowerment of the sovereign individual. When you think about the state of men, like if we roll the tape forward now, we're in the year 2022, and it's been a generation or two since that moment. And I'm just curious, like, what are you, what's your view of the state of being a man in this, this moment? Boy. <laughs> Honestly, it's, I, I don't know. I do know that the system, this just really scares me, frankly, Luke. Um, the system is becoming so oppressive with uh, with the lies that we've witnessed over the last couple of years the the, the lockdown all that stuff i've talked to you know some young people and i even heard you know what a terrible time to be young and here's the other thing i do know though is that i'm on the uh, the mkp mankind project international call every single month and they report in every month what's happening in their country what's happening in france and south africa and australia and what they're finding is that the young people are pouring in right now when we first started it was all our age so it was all those guys in their you know, 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. But now it's, uh, and I, I've noticed it at the welcome homes, uh, which is the uh, after the training, men get together to kind of be welcomed home into their community, is that the, the, there's way more young guys than uh, I remember in the past. So it, it, it appears, if I were to use that as a, as a first-person observation, that generation is really seeking something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is partly why you and I became friends um, you know, a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, no, more, more than a few. <laughs> Bill was kindly pointing out my silver hair that is new <laughs> since last he saw me. <laughs> but, you know, in the early 2000s, you and I met at a, at a men's conference in mm-hmm. the Midwest, the Heartland Men's Conference in Columbia, Missouri. And what I, what I really appreciate about you, Bill, is that you always see the best in what's possible in the people around you. And there's this thing where you kind of you, you collect people and then you kind of put them together. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and to see what kind of alchemical reaction can, can create the next thing that's needed for this time. And I've seen you do this so many times and I was yep. fortunate yep. to be one of these ingredients <laughs> <laughs> back in the early two thousands. And I remember we met, we had a summit and the question was what do young men need in the year 2002? And we met over a weekend up in, uh, Windsor, Ontario, and Canada, and asked, what, what, what do young men need? That question inspired us to create some experiences and a bit of a training for young people. And 
and that you helped us, you know, helped mentor. And, and for me, this was the first experience I had of like really squarely landing my personal mission, which was to offer experiences of transformation to people. Right. And we created this organization called beyond the machine yeah. and it ended up, right. We started with thinking what a young men need. And then we, we re quickly realized it's what a young people need. What does this new generation yeah. need around rites of passage and really mentorship and, and, um, finding elder wisdom to guide them into living lives of purpose, this transpersonal mission that you described and a real blessing for me. I mean, the work I think that we did at that time continues to, to live on, even though the, you know, the organization is no longer here, but, yeah. um, I still get emails about once a year from somebody that says, Oh my gosh, thank you so much for the, you know, the experience of beyond the machine. And that's because of you, Bill, you, you found some great ingredients, put us all together and it really, uh, you know, some of us, it's, you know, for me, it just changed my whole trajectory of what I was doing with my life.